Dr. Sauter, what factors are considered by the healthcare team to determine if a patient is a potential candidate for a transplant? So importantly for the majority of our patients who are being considered for an allogeneic blood or marrow transplant, which means a transplant from a blood system transplant from another person, there are several factors that need to be considered. Most notably is if the patient based on age and health status is independently uh, considered a transplant candidate outside of their blood cancer. So some patients may have other health problems or be of such advanced age that they're not considered uh, an adequate candidate for this relatively risky procedure and treatment for their blood cancers. A second key factor uh, in considering patients for a blood marrow transplant is what type or how intensive the um, conditioning or preparative regimen can be for the transplant uh, um, being weighed against their disease risk. So for these diseases like myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myelogenous le leukemia, based on the quality of the remission going in, as well as the health status and age of the patient in terms of what they can tolerate uh, um, for preparation or conditioning. So largely those two related factors based on the disease and tolerance of intensity of preparation and conditioning weighed against the, the health status uh, of the patient being considered for transplantation in addition to their age. Thank you. And why has transplantation become an option for more MDS and AML patients? Typically patients with MDS, particularly as well as AML, tend to be uh, of more advanced age. So patients not only in their 50s, but also 60s, 70s, or even 80s year, years of age. Um, around those patient populations, we've learned to do less intensive transplants or something called reduced intensity transplants to, to be able to mitigate significant toxicity and risk of death related to the procedure. Secondarily, being able to measure uh, residual disease at a very high fidelity or high level of granularity with regard to remission status has been able to prognosticate or risk adapt those patients for particular, for particular types of transplants. Lastly, the, the burgeoning advances in what we call alternative donor transplants. So transplants from patients that, or from uh, uh, donors who are not a complete match, such as a matched sibling or a matched unrelated donor at a tissue typing level we've been able to do more mismatched unrelated donor transplants as well as half matched transplants or something called haploidentical transplants for patients that may have a uh, sibling or a child that is actually half matched to them as opposed to the historic standard of a, a matched sibling donor transplant. So those advances in being able to mitigate toxicity around the transplant as well as utilization of uh, alternative both unrelated and related donors has really expanded access and the pool of availability to patients with, uh, particularly with myeloid disorders, including MDS and AML. Thank you. And what's on the horizon for continued improvements in transplantation outcomes? So what has continued to be on the horizon for uh, transplantation as a procedure is improvements in treatments of some of the complications, including graft versus host disease, as well as prevention of certain infections in the setting of a severely immunocompromised state. Um, in the last few years, there have been a number of drugs approved in those settings, including a drug called Latermavir for the prevention of a viral infection called cytomegalovirus, as well as the approval of three different agents for graft versus host disease in patients that do not have adequate response to what we would consider standard uh, first line therapy with corticosteroids. So those continue to be advances in the support of care. In terms of being able to, to uh, risk stratify and risk adapt patients, we've learned through uh, uh, contemporary prospective studies that depending on depth of remission, it may alter our decision whether or not to proceed to transplant. And then lastly, uh, the introduction of novel agents as maintenance therapy after the transplant 
or around the time of the transplant to help improve disease control without introducing significant risk of toxicity to the actual transplantation procedure continues to be a research imperative uh, in the contemporary era and beyond. Thank you. And finally, why is it important for patients to consider clinical trials for transplantation? Unfortunately, despite the advances and the improvement in outcomes uh, for transplantation, with transplantation for many blood cancers or hematologic malignancies, there are still subsets of patients based on risk as well as based on physiology and age that do not do well with transplant, particularly around certain higher risk blood cancers. So it becomes very important for those patients where we can prognosticate uh, the ability to cure the hematologic malignancy as being quite low to be considered for clinical trials, not with not just with drugs, but hopefully in the near future with um, more novel cellular based therapies to, to be able to really har harness immunology of either the patient's own immune system or a donor's immune system for treatment of their blood cancers.